I have to admit that, that, that having been now almost 40 years away from, from uh, 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 Cook College, as it was, well, no, it was College of Agriculture and Environmental Science. The I was the last graduating year as my bachelor's degree uh, from Cook College, uh, or before it became Cook College, I'll get it right. Anyway, um, it's quite nice to actually be back. And then as a graduate student at Bush, I have to admit that I spent a lot of Friday afternoons moving sometimes into Friday evening, Saturday morning uh, at this fermentation club, uh, also playing volleyball. And, uh, and, and so it was, uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, always and great fun to actually come back now as a speaker instead of somebody who's sort of sitting and listening. Um, and I do have very fond memory. Doug, Doug's correct. Uh, uh, we isolated Halomonas, uh, I guess, when I was working on the Bush campus. And uh, about six months ago, I learned that that is now the largest microbial genus and family in the, in, in the world. Uh, sort of surprised me that it ever got in that way, but I just kept on allowing people to, you know, proving species and things. And we now have some 68 uh, individual species in that genus and five genera within the family, all of which have come from the original root organism. So it's, a, it's, it's been a pretty, pretty big group of organisms um, and quite fun. And, and yes, I did, by the way, for those of you who are students or those of you who are older, uh, R.G.E. Murray inherited his father's laboratory at the University of Western Ontario. And um, we, were, we were discussing uh, touring the Waxman Museum and one of the things while I was there was that Bob Murray got really worked up one day and he was uh, crawling around the laboratory saying, I know that they're here. And we couldn't figure out what he was talking about. And he climbed up, and this is about a 65-year-old man, he climbed up on a series of stairs and he suddenly, entire head, legs, everything, only his legs were sticking out. And he's digging in the back of this cabinet and he's yelling, Eureka, I found them. Brings out a set of cultures. Um, 800 enteric microorganisms for which he had exact records of the patient, the time of day, what the person was being treated for, and, and, and um, the, uh, oh, just everything. And the story was that all of these cultures had been placed, and this goes back to sort of how I even ended up doing some of this. All of these organisms had been placed on slants sealed 10 years prior to the discovery of penicillin. And they had been put, and he remembered it because of the fact that he was the, his father. They were on brain, heart, and fusion agar, and his father brought him in on Saturday, handed him brains, hearts, from the local uh, slaughterhouse in buckets, and said, here, Bob, make me my media. And he had made the media that put these 800 organisms in there. Um, and, the, and, and the, the museum in London was now coming over to, do, to, to see whether or not these organisms were there. And that was the group that, that they did the survey on of multiple drug resistance prior to, uh, prior to that date. Uh, they had been in culture in these tubes now for some 80 plus years. And over 80% of them were still viable. So we were actually spent a, quite a bit of time re-isolating all these salmonella and E. coli that had been put down well before those early years. So that was kind of a, a, a stimulatory aspect of the interest that I ended up with. And we are far older than that. Um, but I will tell you the exact way that this thing started. Every, a lot of people say, how did you ever, how did some guy who runs around in the oceans and gets trained in uh, uh, marine microbiology at Rutgers and works on the uh, uh, coastal, marine coastal groups and everything. How did you end up underground in some geologic formation? And I like to say that it was because one of my students during one of my classes, and, and this is actually true, raised their hand and asked me how long I thought a microorganism could survive in a salt crystal. And I couldn't give them a really good answer. I could give them some anecdotal answers and said, oh, you know, maybe 100 years, 150. And finally, he went out and got a sample which we thought was a 50,000 year old uh, uh, salt isolated an organism. Turned out that that salt was a lot older. It was from a flooded mine in Louisiana. But that started all this stuff off. And since then, uh, 
We'll see if this works. Since then, we have moved into studies on ancient organisms, ancient microbes. Um, and, and why we do it or what they are interesting in, well, the first thing is that they do provide a great window into the state of biological systems uh, back in those ancient periods. I mean, you're just dealing with an organism, particularly when they're live, and many of them are, you're dealing with an organism whose biochemistry was made to, 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 to reproduce, grow, and do everything on an earth that we no longer can see. And so what we can actually ask questions of is, okay, what's your biochemistry like? What kinds of things do you prefer? What kinds of things do you like to eat? And doggone it, if they basically look like today, you can begin to say, well, maybe there's just a whole lot not different. Uh, so you can learn some things about the, you know, those ancient periods. Um, I was discussing this this afternoon, and this is a big one, is, is, is uh, this is survival and stability of these microbes and these macromolecules far beyond anything we're able to accomplish. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of years, even hundreds of thousands of years, and these things are naturally preserved, still functional, and, and, and still, in some cases, viable. Uh, and we can, in fact, and you'll see in a little bit, uh, we can even sequence DNA from even older materials. So it's, it's quite uh, a, a good thing. This is something that I've been coming up with as, a, as sort of evolving, I guess, myself into a geologic microbiologist. I think that we uh, overlook the fact that, I, that, that of the importance of microorganisms and their relationship not just with the soil but with the very rock of the, of the planet. I think these are part of Earth's gene bank. I think this is a natural process. I think organisms, and we have actually data uh, that I, I won't have time to show you today. That's a whole nother lecture. But I, we have data that actually shows that given the opportunity, these, many of these microorganisms will, in fact, actually swim into the rock and allow themselves to be trapped. And they will form a huge biofilm where that rock is going to entrap them. And you will not find a single organism along the surfaces that are not going to form into these inclusion areas or into these, these water trapped areas uh, of the rock. So literally they have evolved and moved on uh, in such a way that they are basically in there and the rock goes back under, rock, rock goes underground, comes back up, releases the organism and you just have this sort of microbial process. So personally I have to admit that I'm real glad to hear, uh, I had a, 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 a geologist at National Science Foundation one time say to me that that he was so happy because his program was funding mine he was he was so happy to know that geologists had discovered there was life on earth and my response to that was and I'm happy that microbiologists have discovered there are rocks there too and 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 that's part of this this whole sort of thing um, it does place a date we can actually I'll show you in a little bit this is you're going to see the first data uh, that we've been able to develop that actually places a datum on evolution, not in the sense of, okay, this, this T-Rex is sitting here in a 65 million year old rock formation, but I'm going to show you at least one genus of microorganism. We can, I, I'm pretty sure we can place a, some sort of a date on to say before, prior to this date, it wasn't here. After that, it is here. And that, whole, that has a whole lot of uh, implications. If you're a person like me, and, and, and I have to admit, uh, and I have to credit uh, Rutgers, to be honest with you, uh, for instilling in me a really highly interdisciplinary or love of interdisciplinary knowledge. I just, I, I just love working with people in as many different fields as I can. This happens to be an extremely highly disciplinary field. You'll see that in a little sec, in a, in a little bit, but it's, it's, it's great fun. Uh, truth is, it's just plain neat, okay? I, it's cool, okay? Putting a hard hat on, going underground, going into a mine, mucking around, banging on a wall, you know, it's great science. And, and, and the fact is, it's really fun when you can go down, you're muddy, dirty, banging around in a rock, and then you come back up and you progressively end up working with that same piece of rock, but when you finally end up working with it, you're in a clean room wearing double sterile gowns in a hood, with air samplers being taken all around you and somebody sitting there and saying, if I get a microbe, you gotta stop, you know? And so it's, it's, it's really cool that way. And there's one other one that I like to say and, and, and like to remind people, and I hope you can see that, uh, but this kind of stuff actually generates lots of public excitement. And, and my personal opinion is, 
uh, sort of Doug alluded to is that if we scientists don't generate this and don't generate public excitement, we're not doing the service we need to do because these are the people who pay the bills. I mean, the, you know, taxes, grants come from taxes. And if we don't keep them excited in what we do, then uh, we're missing the boat. So here are the scientists that I do work with already and kind of what they impact. And there's a couple that I've left off of here. Uh, geology, you will see the fact that we, I work with a lot of geological systems. I always work with geologists because it is the geology that provides the context for all the interpretations. It provides the data, helps determine the age, and also is the thing that helps you determine the pristine nature. One of the biggest problems with this kind of research is that you've got to be able to say, this is a pristine sample. This sample formed one time and one time only and has been sealed ever since. Because with, if you can't do that, or if I can't convince you that we can do that, would be a better way of saying it, if I can't convince you that, that we can do that, then everything I say is just useless. There's, just, there's, there's no defending it. But if you can defend it, if you can demonstrate that to the people that you are speaking with, then in fact you, you have an argument to make. And that, they, that, um, that has to be provided by the geology. You'll see in a little bit it can't be provided by the biology. Um, pure microbiology, classic sort of stuff, aseptic techniques, ID, biological understanding, particularly here. The truth is geologists have no clue when it comes to contamination. Just none. Um, there's a great, great uh, uh, thing that just, re that just came out a few years ago on the finding of uh, soft tissues and uh, even potential blood vessels in T-Rex bones. Some of you may have heard it. Um, it, it. It hit science. It was one of the top ten discoveries of the year in science. And Mary Schweitzer, um, who did the work, came and visited Westchester and visited our facility and promptly said, if you saw what I do, you'd throw me out. But um, she had a picture that she showed, and it was so classic. Because here she is finding a bone. That bone has uh, uh, soft tissue in it, has protein, has all this stuff in there. And her picture of here we are finding the bone is a photograph of the bone in the rock with her technician sitting on the bone, eating lunch, drinking a beer. <laughs> and you can see the label on the beer. And we look at that as microbiologists and we say, oh, please. You know? Or the first thing they do is they find a bone and they, they mix up in the field some, some uh, uh, plaster of Paris and they slap it all over the thing using their hands. You know? Now, we don't get sterile samples underground, but we sure are cognizant of we're not going to beat them to death before we bring them up on the surface. And, and, and we're able to sort of say that. Um, and then, of course, there's molecular methods, uh, obviously providing phylogenetic inference and things like that. One I haven't led, put on here right now, or I've left off of here, is the physicists I also work with, uh, who literally help me work on the uh, potential survival in radiation and radiation uh, causes and all sorts of stuff. So, so let me give you some evidence of stability. And I hope you can see this. This one, unfortunately, might be washed out a little bit. Um, let me see if I can knock out this light for a few seconds. I know our. Uh, OK. So this is actually a salt pan in Tanganyika. Um, so it's modern. But one of the things that happens is this is a natural salt pan. So occasionally it floods. Then it dries down. As it dries down, that, that salt and that uh, soil crack. And you can see these cracks right here, like that. And we've all even seen these, these cracking. And you, you see it right in your own garden. And you see it right in your own lawn. When you get enough dry weather, you get those soil cracks. Well, the truth is this can only happen on the surface of the earth where you have drying, drying that gives you cold and heat. Because this is an effect of simply heat, then cold, heat, then cold. And so you get these, these, these expansions and contractions of the soil matrix, and eventually you get the crack. All right? So this is an example of surface 
type events. Here's the crack. Here is the crack. See it? There, there, goes right around to there and back up. But this crack is in 125 million year old salt and it's 800 feet underground. So what that says first off is that this formation was above ground, sank, but has not been, it has not in the intervening, oops, well, there it is again. It has not in the intervening time been destroyed. It has not had geologic movement like this. It has not had water running through it that would dissolve the system and change it. That's a surface feature that exists underground. In Hutchinson, Kansas, I don't have a good photograph of it because it's very small, but in Hutchinson, Kansas, we have a site that we're working on where right up in the, right up in the, I keep doing that, um, right up in the, I'm just going to sort of show it here, but right on the side of the wall, you can look up and you can see ripples from waves as they moved through the formation. And when you stand in the uh, mine with your light on your head and you kind of go like that, you can see those ripples going down the ceiling and you can in fact orient yourself to say, all right, it was going that way. The water, the waves were like that. That's a surface feature. And you can't get it anywhere else except in a surface environment where the water is being blown by the wind. And you've all seen it when you've been on the beach. Exact same sort of thing. In under Detroit, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the folks that when I go to Detroit, I go underground and I actually get the best view. Um, but, but in Detroit, there, I hope there's no Detroit folks in here. I probably just insulted. <laughs> um, <clears throat> in Detroit, we actually have areas of the formation where we were able to pull down the uh, rock above and we have puddles from the rain still remaining in that rock. So these sorts of things are the first indication that in fact this is a stable rock, this is a stable formation formed one time, one time only and these are the only kinds of formations I use. Do you need the lights back on? Okay. Um, Here's another form of uh, uh, stability that we also look for. This is in uh, Carlsbad, New Mexico, uh, in the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant. This is a 250 million year old rock formation. Oh, gosh. And this is about a two meter distance. And what I want you to take a look at is this layer here, this is a mud layer. This comes in with mud during, when the water, fresher water floods the basin. Then as evaporation occurs, you get another layer later on. Then you get a saltier layer that comes in across the top. That evaporates. You get a little bit of uh, anhydride reaction. And finally up here, as, the, as the, the ocean water dries completely, you get a region of what is referred to as polyhalite. It's a magnesium potassium rich salt. But it's, it's up here. And then right above it, you can just barely see it with these lights on, but right above here is another mud layer. So the beginning of a new event. Okay. Importance of it. Well, first off, see these little white spots in here? As this mud sits, when the next bit of water comes across and it begins to find and seep its way down through cracks in this mud layer, it produces these very slow growing called displacive halite. That's very slow growing stuff. It's actually clear and you can see it. But you know that it grew very, very slowly because it's a large crystal. Up here, this layer contains a large number of very tiny crystals. And I'll show you a picture of them in a couple seconds. Tiny, tiny crystals that show evidence of growing in hot weather, cold weather, hot weather, cold weather hot weather, cold weather. And we can look at the individual crystal and know that. Now, you're underground. This is 2,150 feet underground. The temperature here is a permanent 60 Fahrenheit. You can't grow a crystal hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold in permanent 60 degree weather. It's just going to grow in one way. One more part of this stability. Notice how flat this is? And that is 
Actually, the next layer is up as well. This here, the water washed in, washed off over this, cut this off, and then stopped. But this flat layer here and here, this is actually called the marker bed in this mine. And the marker bed is a bed that, that miners choose for its stability. And in the southern part of the mine, this is right about where it is here, it's right about eye level. And you can follow this bed through five miles of, of, of uh, five miles north south, two miles east west underground. And it will be at eye level the entire time. If you decide, as they did uh, here, that they wanted to go up a layer, then you simply take this marker bed, and rather than keeping it at eye level, you move it to your feet and you go up. And in the northern half of the mine, which is another three miles in all directions, this thing sits at your feet. So what it says is that that formation lay, was laid down and then didn't do this, didn't get washed around. That is stability. That is as stable as you're going to get it. So it also says that this is the order in which these occurred. And in fact, if you date them, this is a little younger than this, et cetera. Well, the mud is. These salt crystals here are this age. And you can go right on up. And this whole formation is like this. It's been actually, the geologists uh, did this mapping all the way from 2,150 feet all the way up to ground surface every 10 meters. So we have a really good history uh, on this thing. OK, now I mentioned the hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. When salt crystals grow, such as in Puerto Rico, in Cabo Rojo, or anywhere, when they grow quickly, when a salt crystal or a crystal grows quickly in, a, in a, an aqueous environment, one of the things it does is traps water. But growing quickly, it traps that water in tiny little inclusions. And you get a pattern that in a photograph looks like this. If you were looking at this crystal, uh, if I had it here for you to show, for you to look at, you would see this as being a white band. It's a white milky crystal. When it grows slowly, it grows clear. When it grows quickly, it grows like that. And in some cases, such as in here, you can even begin to see individual banding patterns. Uh, now, one person, Paul Knauth, tried to tell me that that was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I don't believe him. I told him I thought it was more like August. But the point being that these things are very stable. If, however, you take one of these crystals and you heat it, first off, I should say, each one of these inclusions, you notice how the crystal is square? So are the inclusions. They're actually called negative crystals because they're negative squares. They're just negative little cubes inside. Filled with water. And if you take these individual inclusions and you take these kinds of crystals and you put pressure on them or a lot of heat, dissolution effects and chemistry take over and these square inclusions become elongated and they take on different forms. If they crack, water leaks out and you get a vapor bubble. So by taking these crystals and looking at these things, we can tell whether or not they were original, primary, we can tell whether they've cracked. We can tell whether they've been heated or cooled. We can even, in fact, if I were to show it to you, we can even tell you how, which direction the heat came from by the elongation pattern. So what we do is we start off with all the crystals we bring out, and we sort through them one by one. We've started with as many as uh, uh, 100 kilos and sorted through those crystals to come up with 50 or 60 that meet all the criteria. It's a long bit of work, but, we, but it, it, it actually, after a while, you get pretty good at it. You can kind of look at them and toss them and keep some. All right, so here it is. Now, this is a modern crystal. This is what they look like. By the way, there's one more thing. See how this, see how this line comes in and you get this? These are actually called chevrons. But you see how that forms like that? This crystal grew this way. It was actually sitting, this points up. So this was actually sitting on the bottom, pointing up. So we didn't even tell you where the crystal grew and the direction when we look at these. All right. So that's a 24-year-old crystal from Baja, California. This one over here is a 125-million-year-old crystal uh, from Brazil. There's the lines. 
and there's the pattern. There's the direction. This one here, it's about 250 million years old. There's the individual pattern, and there's the direction. This one over here is 419 million years old, and there's the pattern. So it's a stable, isolated environment. You can't form it underground only at the surface. Therefore, and since all of these, by the way, we've analyzed all of these, uh, you can actually analyze these individual uh, uh, inclusions and the brine within them. And the, fa and the reality is that the brine in these has the chemistry of ocean water from each of these different eras. So the argument then is that these are referred to, these are primary crystals. They formed one time and one time only. They went underground and in the sterile system they were protected and maintained. Those are the kinds of crystals that we, that we use all the time. Microbiologically, because that's what I do, uh, <clears throat> here are our basic procedures, just to give you an idea. All of our material is autoclave for at least an hour. Doesn't matter how much we have in there. Usually we use nothing more than about 25 mils of media at a time. So it gets autoclave for at least an hour. We do make our media in batches. It's all pre-incubated for approximately two weeks. Uh, batches include usually about anywhere from 40 to 50 individual enrichment flasks if we're going to grow something or uh, 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 even um, PCR extraction buffers, things like that. Uh, obviously without the enzymes in them. But uh, all these sorts of things are pre-incubated or pre-tested. And our basic rule is that if any one comes up contaminated from any one batch, all the whole batch is thrown away and you start over. Okay. Um, all of our workers, whenever we are working in the clean room, everyone is gowned head to foot. Uh, the person working with the individual crystals and in the hood is double gowned. So their front is sealed just as well as the back. So they, they are working. And of course, gloves and, and everything else. We have constant contamination checks. Um, we have now installed just this last year, in, uh, 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 in fact, the last three months, we have installed a series of active air contamination checks where we, can, where we take half liter or half cubic meter of air, 500 liters, and we will suck it down onto a growth medium such as triptych soy agar, sabrod dextrose agar. We also have uh, blank plates where we can add the medium that we're using on that day, and we will impinge air, air samples onto that. Uh, we also have a, um, uh, a set of gelatin membranes that are used to retain DNA and viruses in the air as we are working. We have two sets. We have one set that is constantly sampling the outer environment and one that is constantly sampling the hood in which we are working. If anything there comes, comes up contaminated, including the hood, everything for that day is thrown away. It doesn't matter where the, where the growth was. Um, so we, we also have that going on as well. I always like to put this in for the students. This is one for the students. It's veto power for all. Imagine, imagine you, you're, you're working in a laboratory with Professor Evely here, and you have the right to watch what he does. And if, he, if you even think that he has taken his sterile needle or whatever and touched something, you have the right to say, stop. You can't start over. That's veto power for all. And he can't sit and go, no, I didn't either. Doesn't matter. Once we're in the clean room, everybody is watching everybody else. And so you get the right. I've, and the students just love it. I, I, work, I don't work with graduate students. You guys are jaded. I've got, <laughs> I've got a lot of, most of, so many of my students are undergraduates. And they just love being in the laboratory with the professor where they get to say, no, you touch that. Now I get it all the time. And I was like, OK, fine. Um, our current level of sterility, the current sterility assurance value that we've placed on all of this, and we're actually getting a little bit higher than this, but our current sterility level is something like 1 in 10 to the minus 9. So everything I'm going to show you has a sterility, a contamination probability of less than one chance in a billion. Okay? Um, I think it's very important for me to be able to tell you that uh, as a number. Obviously, no sterility is perfect. It's, there's all a probability function, so that's the probability. Um, and I've, I was in China a couple, about a year or two ago and had somebody from Australia say, I think it was contaminated. It was one chance in a billion. I said, okay, fine. So, you know, now explain the other 12. You know. But, okay, so 
what have we gotten so far? This is an overview for you. In 22-year-old uh, uh, crystals, the 22, 24-year-old Baja California crystal I showed you before, we can isolate fungi, bacteria, archaea, DNA out of that, uh, every crystal. Every crystal. They're all live. We can get you whatever you want. I can give you, you know, you come in, I can take one of these crystals uh, and pull it up, give you whatever you want. This is a penicillium, uh, from the bacteria, all different kinds, halophilic archaea, and DNA from all of them. So it's not a, it's not a problem. Go out about 100 million or 100,000 years to Death Valley, and we will pick up, we do pick up archaea. Bacteria, DNA, we have not found fungi. They seem to drop out really quick. We haven't, we haven't yet found them in here. We keep looking, but we, we haven't found them. And about 60 out of every 100 crystals, about 60%, do contain something. At uh, 8 uh, to 23 million year old, I just stuck the 8 in here, but at 8 to 23 million year old rock samples, we find a lot of archaea. We find DNA about 20% of the time. Um, at 125, we find archaea and DNA also, and about 8 out of every 100. Uh, I'll come back to this in a second. And then in the 250 million year old material and 270, we, we have found bacteria. I'm not sure, well, I, I think I have a reason for why we find the archaea DNA here and, and no bacteria there, and then we find the bacteria here and we haven't found the archaea. We, we, we are uh, hoping to get a grant uh, starting again in June to test that, to, to test that theory. We'll, we're, we're, if, if we get it, we're going to be testing it in the Dead Sea and in uh, Hutchinson, Kansas, as well as uh, Carlsbad. And then at 412 million years old, 419 uh, million, I was corrected on these, uh, 419 million, this is under Detroit, we find DNA. And we find that in about uh, less than one in 100 crystals that we actually sample. Now remember, we've started off with this big winnowing and we've come down. So I'm talking about the 54 or 100 samples that we get out of that we accept to say we will sample these. All right? That's the 100 here. That's what that is. We don't just select 100 crystals. Okay? Everybody follow me now so you know what I'm talking about. All right. The thing about this is this is after we get past about 100,000 100, years, the distribution of the organisms and biomaterials in these things is very heterogeneous. And so you may read about people who go in and they, they walk into the mine and they say, well, I took this sample. I didn't find anything. They must be wrong. Well, the fact is that we can do the same thing. I'll give you an example here at this 125 million year old rock here. The, I give you the statistic as 8 out of 100. All of these uh, crystals came from, or the, all of the 8, I should say, came from a section of a core that was at 768 meters underground. 768.5. I'm sorry. 768.5. If I take a sample from the, what looks like the exact same salt crystal from 768 meters, half meter above, I get nothing. If I drop 100 and set to, 100, to 769 meters, I get nothing. I only get hits at 768.5 meters. And when I'm at that point, the actual number is about, uh, between 8 and 8 and 20 percent, 8 and 20 of the crystals. But we've sampled others, so I incorporate them all in there. But there's one spot, right in that in that mine in that formation, that gives me survival, not above, not below. The same thing is true in these 250 million year old and 400 million year old materials. We can walk around, we can find hot spots, and then we find a lot more cold spots where there's nothing. So. The probability is that if somebody walks into one of these things and just says, I'm going to take this sample, goes up to the wall, bang, takes the sample, the probability is they're going to get a negative. It's much higher. So we have to spend an awful lot of time doing this stuff. All right. So let's get in some of the meat of this. Um, I took out my one slide. I usually say that we're going to start off on a tree, and then I show you a photograph of a tree I took over here in Douglas and talk about it being deep-rooted and everything. But I kind of I got away from that because the geologists didn't understand it. They looked at it and went, that's a tree. What are you talking about? So um, this, is, this is, is, is two sets of samples from Death Valley, 30,000-year-old um, material. These are archaea. And from that Brazilian core, this is that 768.5 meter. And 
Um, we just simply did a DNA sequence on these particular organisms. Now these are live cultures here. Both of th this and these eight here are live cultures taken out of salt crystals. We also compared these organisms with a group of microbes that were also isolated. Uh, these were isolated from other 125 million year old rock in England, but these were isolated by a friend of mine. They were not ours. Well, we put them into this uh, uh, database and two things happened. First of all, we ended up discovering for, that we had a, an alkalophilic group of organisms. We got it from here. We got it from Death Valley. We got one from Death Valley and one from Brazil. And they are alkalophiles. They prefer growth at 9 and 10. The salt crystal isn't an, a natron or anything. It's just 9 or 10. They like it. And they have the lipid pattern, the protein pattern, and DNA and everything else in biochemistry of alkalophiles. And then we found another group of halophiles that are related to Halobacterium salinorum. We'll come back to this one in a second. Um, and they are, they group together. But one of the things that a lot of the critics that, that, that I have worked with or talked to or argued with um, have said is, you know, this is all false. This has got to be false. It's got to be false because there's no branch lengths. You've got to have branch lengths. There's no branch. How come, how come some organism from 125 million years ago, some microbe from 125 million years ago, has the same DNA sequence as an organism from 30,000 years ago, let alone an organism, Halobacterium salinorum, from today? Because Halobacterium salinorum was isolated in 1930 from a buffalo hide. Okay. Well, that is a bit of a problem. That is a bit of a problem, but I'll show you why in a second. Then we go it even further, and then it sort of, you know, I, I, I've never been one. I've never been one to walk away from an argument. So now I bury myself a little further, and I show you. Okay, well, here's a Permian-aged organism, a Permian bacterium, from 250 million years ago, and it's got the same sequence as a microorganism that's isolated directly from Death Valley. So I got more problems now because this is like there's three base pairs difference in the 16s RNA between these two. Right. So the 16 S's don't seem to be a whole lot of change. They seem to be similar. And if you think about molecular evolutionary theory that those of us who are microbiologists have been steeped in over the last few years, there ought to be a branch here of some length. But there should, according to, I mean, we always talk about the fact that there should be a difference. Well, that's the 16S. But if you go out from the 16S, and we did that with, this is a, 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 an automated southern blot uh, where we actually used uh, echo R1 and PST2, and we cut up some of the DNA, targeted, targeted the flanking regions around the 16S RNA. Now something else starts to happen. First of all, the Permian organisms are, in fact, similar to one another, but they are very different from that Maris mortui. And, and you'll have to excuse the name here. Uh, the, the, there, there are two reasons why this name is changing from an S Maris mortui to a V Maris mortui. It'll change back again. Uh, first of all, when you run these kinds of prints, the data uh, collection system that we have forces you to put the name in. And then you cannot change the name. You cannot alter this data, what's, these data whatsoever. Um, Maris mortui was originally isolated as a Sally bacillus Maris mortui. Then my good friend in, in Spain, Antonio Ventosa, changed it to Virgi bacillus Maris mortui. And I was fine with that. He, you know, I'm a somewhat taxonomist anyway, so OK, you changed it. Well, the problem was that, as you'll see in the next slide, it, as you'll see, uh, here, between my running this one and my running that one, he changed it back again. <laughs> so he's changed the name on me, and that's why you see it. But this is the same strain, Maris mortui. It's the same organism. Um, the hmm? comment on Maris mortui for the Latin expert here. Oh, Maris mortui, yeah, uh, dead sea. 
Dead Sea. So stick at the Dead Sea because that name hasn't changed. Forget the other part. Um, same thing has happened with this, oops, with this Sally Bacillus and, and, and uh, everything else. But the point of this slide isn't to, isn't to argue about the taxonomy. The point of this slide is to show you how similar or dissimilar these organisms actually are. All right? So you get a pattern, but look at the difference in the individual ECHOR1 patterns as you move away from, the DNA, from that central DNA of the 16S. Um, you cannot, by the way, the differences between these organisms are so great that you can't force this machine. You can't, you can't widen your parameters wide enough to get this machine to, or get this system to say that this organism and that organism are similar. It just refuses to do it. We've also done it with lipid patterns, and the lipid patterns uh, are different as well. And we've done it one other way. Oh. This is not something that you normally use a rapid uh, gel for, but we said, what the heck, and we did it. So we did a kind of a shotgun uh, of uh, uh, primers in a rapid type of gel, and we ran it out. Um, and actually, this was done by, uh, confirmed by a group in Arizona. So here are the Permian strains, and here is the pattern of a Permian organism, like that. Here is that Virgi bacillus, Sally bacillus, whatever you want to call it, Maris mortui, and there it is there. <laughs> and you can repeat it. You can do a variety of things. We've done this with six different sets of primers, and while you get a different pattern, you always get the same thing. That is that this pattern and this organism are not the same, despite the fact that they have 16S ribosomal RNAs that are almost identical. Okay. So again, as you move away from that core housekeeping set of genes in these organisms, you start to see differences. Um, we have also done these differences. I don't have the time to show you this, but we have, we have done these differences. It's more salt tolerant or, or it's more temperature tolerant uh, than, than another organism and less temperature tolerant than one from Tunisia with the same genes. I mean, once you get outside of these DNAs, it'll have different biochemistries and, and different sorts of things. So these are not the same organism. Their 16S ribosomal RNAs are the same, and that's a bit of a problem for us. But let's go on. Now, I'm going to apologize. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, if I've got my, my list. No, I don't. Okay. The next one is going to be one you're not going to be able to see, so I'm going to have to kind of explain it, but it's the only way to put it on there. But um, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine by the name of S.K. Willerslev in Denmark, who also works on this, some of you may have heard uh, SK's, uh, uh, of, of S.K. Willers Lev. He's the fellow who does the uh, DNA work in the cave bears and uh, human um, uh, migrations. Uh, strangely enough, he does it all in the United States, but his work is in Denmark. Um, also did uh, work on polar bears, woolly mammoths, a variety of other sorts of things. Um, so he's, he is a big DNA, ancient DNA guy, and he came up with these proposals. Um, and that is that in any one of these, to, to accept the idea that these things are really that old, the specimen needs to be well dated. You need a properly equipped, physical isolated, physically isolated, clean lab. The sample moves from the clean lab to the molecular or culture room in only one direction, never goes back. You have frequent decontamination and your reagents, tools, all that sort of stuff. Uh, extensive decontamination, we do that. Uh, these salt samples, by the way, before we use them, are put into 10 molar sodium hydroxide for five minutes, briefly washed, then placed in 10 molar hydrochloric acid for, te for, for an additional minute, minimum five minutes before we do any sampling with them. So they're pretty, pretty heavily uh, uh, sterilized and, and beaten up, um, in addition to being washed with, with other sorts of things. We have bl blank controls. We do, amp we do our amplification. Re we can do relatively short or relatively long base pair uh, uh, amplifications. Um, cloning, PCR, we, I'll show you that in a second. Reproducibility within laboratories. This one I've argued with uh, in yellow. Uh, SK, SK wrote my name into the publication and kind of had me a little mad. But he basically said that before I'd be allowed to publish any of this really ancient stuff that I should send my samples to everybody else for confirmation and somehow wait until they were done before I published. And I said, well, I'm really not going to do that. Uh, but we do send samples to other laboratories uh, you know, before. And then there's this evolutionary rates test. We're not going to talk about that, but we, I'll show you some that do pass. OK. We set, out to prove, we set out to do exactly what he says. In fact, we've actually rebuilt our laboratory. Uh, 
we have three laboratory rooms at Westchester and samples move from the dirty lab to the clean lab to the molecular lab and they never go the other way. And those are physically separated on different floors. We're even getting ready to set up another laboratory in a, in a, in a completely different building to, if we have to, to, to do some of this work. So we've, we've accomplished all of these things, by the way, okay? Except maybe this one, we get our reproducibility afterwards. Okay, now I, I realize you can't see this slide, and, and I, I apologize for that, but I have no other way of showing it to you. Um, what we did is we went through all these formations, and you know, I'll, I'll set the stage here, and then I'll kind of describe it to you. Um, we went through all these formations, and we took samples from all of them, and then using the same procedures with salt crystals and materials of different ages, we isolated DNA, and we did the DNA sequencing from that. Then we took those uh, isolated pieces of DNA, we cloned them, we sent the clones to Korea, not our sequencer, but we sent it to Korea, let them sequence it, send it back to us. When we got all the data from the clones, we combined it with all known DNA sequences of halophiles. And we said, all right, let's sort through this and see what happens. All right? And that's the result that you see here. That's why it's so large. Everything that I've already shown you is actually still in here. But now we've added a whole pile of clones along with it. One of the first things that happened was all the clones coming from uh, cr specific groups of crystals, and they're all numbered so we know which ones they are, but everything coming from, this, from clones of specific ages such as, and we've got them colored here as blue and green, clustered together. The blues, uh, the blues are from 419 million year old crystals. The greens, the greens are from 125 million year old crystals. Okay? So all of a sudden, when you put all this stuff together, the Silurian and Cretaceous organisms, or DNA samples, group together. And you can't separate them. They group together here, they group together there, they group together here, and they group together there. We also found something that other people often say we haven't. Remember, I've shown you Sally Bacillus. I've shown you DNA sequences from organisms you can find on the surface. So people said, well, you know, you never find organisms that are different or that don't, aren't here. There's one, two, three <coughs> groups of organisms that don't exist on planet Earth right now. We can't find these sequences anywhere. One more, and that's this group. This group of, of Permian and, Silur and, and uh, uh, Cretaceous or, or Silurian and Cretaceous organisms right here have a 55 base pair insert in their DNA sequence, in the, in the 16S ribosomal RNA of their DNA sequence. We got that exact identical sequence using four sets of primers in the exact same space, and the primers flanked one another, one of which had 900 base pairs in between them, one of which had about 500 base pairs, but we got the exact same sequence using those two primers in the exact same place, and it, the sequence was identical in these six organisms. Okay? We're going to come back to them. All right. So we have Cretaceous and we have Silurian, and then we got these red ones. All, them gr all those grouped together, too. Those red ones are from 23 million year old crystals. Now, the first thing you have to ask, and then we did some other things, and, and in fact, uh, I had Tito send me some crystals and some other organisms, and we tried to re-isolate some things, and we actually got a relative of one of these in this other group here, uh, but we didn't have the 55 base pair sequence. Okay? So that's missing. All right. So let's quickly talk a little bit about the significance here. Why, first off, would Cretaceous samples and Silurian samples group together. There's 300 million years apart. And they're right. There is. But over those 300 million, over the, over the time from four or 500 million years ago to today, the ocean chemistries have cycled from magne high magnesium calcium ratios to low magnesium calcium ratios. Today is they're relatively high. They were low in the Silurian and in the Cretaceous. They became modern in 
uh, about 23 million years ago. So the modern ocean, the M ocean chemistry that we look at today in terms of the ionic uh, composition, 23 million years ago was when it became about 50 million, between 50 and 23 million is when it became what we have today. That turns out to be very similar to um, the, that turns out to be very similar to the Permian period. And we group, we now group these organisms with Permian samples. And we even had a positive control. This was an organism that we isolated from a, per, a, uh, uh, a Permian period, put it back in a crystal and re-isolate it and got the same DNA sequence. So we got that. Okay, so that's the first part. The second thing that became really interesting is this group right up here, first of all. We'll come back to this one, but this group right up here. That group up there, and, and anybody that wants, I'll, I'll be happy to show you this in close up if you want to take a look at it. But that group up here, right there, that is Halobacterium salinarum. And I said Halobacterium salinarum was isolated in the 1930s from a buffalo hide in Canada. It's a modern organism. But when we put in these sequences from the uh, Silurian and Permian, this organism always pulls out and becomes part of the group with the Permian and Silur or the Silurian and Cretaceous, I'm sorry, Silurian and Cretaceous aged material. Right? Always. When you actually take Halobacterium salinarum and you, you group it in with these other guys, it actually always forms its own little group. It, it, it never really joins anybody. It's always kind of an outlier. Well, we did a little more hunting. That buffalo hide was cured in a vat of salt in, in Canada that was cured with 350 million year old salt. Okay? So that's not a modern organism. But it was isolated on, it was isolated on a buffalo hide cured with that salt. So what we think of as a modern creature <laughs> you knew that, right? <laughs> yep. And now, and this is very stable. As long as these are here, this thing is up there. You can't change it. We've tried all different kinds of ways. Now, let's take a quick look at this next group here. I'm not going to come back to this because I don't like this slide. I wish I had something shorter. So try to so kind of remember that there's these half dozen uh, organisms in here with an insert, and that they're sort of related. Back here, they're sort of related to this group of organisms here, which is the group of microbes called Halorubrum and Haloarcula. These are, by the way, Halorubrum and Haloarcula. If you go to any hypersaline environment in the world, you will find Halorubrum and Haloarcula. And I'll speed this up because we're getting a little long and the beer is getting cold, I hope. Mm -hmm. Colder, I hope. Anyway, getting warm. Oh, no. All right. So just a quick show you. Here's that alignment. Um, here's the alignment on these. This is the 55 base pair insert, identical in the exact same place every time. And from different samples, uh, half dozen different crystals. So uh, we'll go past this. This is the, this is, we tried this using the, we found the organism from Puerto Rico and we said, oh wait, maybe this is the wrong, maybe we messed up and there's an organism there and we did and there's the ancient organisms and there's the modern day sequences from a modern day environment. Right, so this is right out of the water, out of Puerto Rico, and, and even there's a, I think that there's a Dead Sea one in here too, and there they still say, no, we're different, we're different, right here. So we did one more thing, we did a secondary structure. So here's our ancient sequence, and there's the secondary. There's the, does it fold? Well, yes, it does. It folds into a typical, a good hairpin loop uh, type system for the 16S ribosomal RNA. And then we just asked the question, if we took this out artificially and we inserted, we inserted it into halorubrum, halobacterium, and a haloarcula, what happens? Well, if you look pretty close, it's you're pretty easy to see what's going to happen. You take this out, you put it over here, and you get garbage. This thing is just completely messed up, just totally non-functional. If you take this out, or if you take this and put this sequence in right here, inhale a rubrum and you redo the secondary structure, you get this secondary structure. If you artificially take this out of the DNA sequence and refold this section, you get this. 
So what happened, what I think this is saying is about 23 million years ago, this 55 base pair sequence disappeared and halo rubrum evolved. And it says it from the geologic record. That's what all those other sequences are about. All those other sequences, all those red ones, they're all identical to this. Or very similar to this, I should say. They're like that. And you only find them. You only find halo rubrum microorganisms, halo rubrum in the geologic record past 50 million to 23 million. We can find them in any of the younger samples we sample. We can't find them in any of the older ones. So there's the datum on the evolution of at least one bacterial genus. So what's our problem? Is there a problem or what is this saying, if you will, um, in terms of current microbial evolution? Some people often say that I'm arguing against the use of sequences. I'm not. I'm using them all the time. I'm arguing that we may need to reinterpret some of our looking. Do, do those lines that we see really have to be there? Do those lines that we, that we, those branches, you know, do those branches really have that kind of timing meaning that we want them to have? The actuality is maybe not. I think the fallacy that we all work with as microbiologists is that we have an expectation of difference. Um, we know, and, and, and uh, that, comes, that comes down here in a second, but just think about that expectation. We have an expectation when we do these DNA sequences and comparatives, we have an expectation that there will be a difference based on evolution and based on evolutionary time. I think that our ancient microbes, all of them, even the living ones and the DNA that we're getting, argue that the clock, or that we, we like to talk about a microbial or evolutionary clock for housekeeping genes is, at least probably doesn't exist. If it does exist, as the uh, editor of Nature said, it's moving vanishingly slow, much slower than we think, uh, which is that statement there. I think also we have, a, we have a situation where we have to look at that some sequences do work. They work best. Hypersaline organisms, they have a set of sequences that work for them. Once it works, if it's a housekeeping gene, if it's a housekeeping gene like a 16S RNA, don't change it. If you change it, you're dead. So they don't change, they just sit there. We have examples of that. I can give you many examples of that in eukaryotes. Uh, and, and this is really the, the, I'll say, the fallacy in terms of the expectation. And that is that we know from the geologic record that eukaryotes are, oops, how do I keep doing that? Um, we know that eukaryotes are, in fact, changing relatively fast from 800 million years through dinosaurs to us. But microbes have been here longer, and I don't think they need to change that fast. I think what we're saying is if we apply this rapid evolution to microbes, I think we're, we're wrong. I think we need to look at microbes as being a whole separate group of organisms that don't change as fast. Now, I don't know why this is. So what does all this tell us? Well, DNA work doesn't tell us the age of the microbes. That comes from the geology and the microbiological techniques. I don't know how old that sequence is, except the rock tells me how old it is. I think, again, the genes that are critical are not changing as fast as we think. I think our cultures and trees have, are mixed up. We have old organisms with modern, and we're in the same circumstance. If you mix modern wine with old wine, how old is the wine? Right? Um, I think that we find that some microbes that are on present day Earth have probably been on present day Earth for a long time. Same genera, same species. I think microbiologists are probably lucky that way. Um, I do think, as I said, Halobacterium is an ancestral genus. For most of the modern organisms, it's at least ancestral. It's been here for quite a while. Its divergence occurred probably out before 400 million years old or million years ago. And we've been able to demonstrate it simply because of the kinds of samples and techniques we're using. Uh, and I've already told you this, Halorubrum first appeared in the geologic record about 23 million years ago, uh, most likely somewhere in that area when the ocean chemistries became modern chemistry. All right, now I want to finish real quick three fast slides um, because I said that, we don't, you got, that, that we're not affecting the fossil record yet. Uh, well, truth is the impacts of what we're doing are being felt now. Um, things that we're doing are being copied. There are numerous samples, and here's some examples for you. Uh, this is our ancient organism. That's the oldest living thing on Earth, but there have been uh, uh, soft tissues discovered in T. rex bone. 
In fact, because of those uh, soft tissues, we actually do have the first uh, 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 T-Rex fossil that we can sex. We know it was a female. And we now know, now looking at the bone, we can now look at the, raw, at, the, at the bone and say, this was a female, this was a male. And so we've made a lot more. Turns out females were larger, for instance, than the males. Uh, this is a frog that is trapped in amber, and we can get its DNA and protein right out. This is a frog here that isn't trapped in amber. It's a fossil, but this leg bone was broken right here, and there was bone marrow in it. We have the entire DNA sequence of woolly mammoths because we can wash their hair. Whoops, I did it again, didn't I? Doug, this thing is going to drive me nuts. Um, if you take and wash their hair, one of the things we've learned is that you don't need hair follicles like CSI to find the DNA sequence. It's in your hair shaft. So you don't need the follicle. You can just wash the hair and get your entire DNA sequence. The DNA sequence of this group of critters here, she's kind of pretty, isn't she? You know? That's a Neanderthal girl. And we can reconstruct her because of her DNA. We, can, we now have, we're about, they're about to publish, not me, but they're about to publish the DNA sequence of the Neanderthals. We even know that they spoke like we do, and some of them had a speech impediment. And they were red-haired, not dark-haired. There's Utzi, uh, using forensic techniques similar to what we've done uh, and, and what I've been describing to you. Uh, we, can, we know where he was the last 36 hours of his life. We even probably have a pretty good idea of how and why he was killed. And a very good possibility of who killed him, not by name, but why they would have killed him, because they probably became his uh, successor, because we know he had a brass knife. He, he was carrying a brass axe, but the brass axe wasn't with his body. But they, they fat, we, you know, you can, you can isolate pieces from it. So uh, we know that. And then this one is a fascinating one. This is the, this is the one I was telling Rick about this afternoon. Uh, this is a 400 or 300, 400 million year old fish. And one of the curators, after some of this stuff started coming out, uh, you see the dating and, and things like that. Uh, after this, one of the curators in the Australian Museum said, I wonder why it is that the jaw of this fish is still attached. We never had to reattach it. He suddenly realized they didn't. He looked in the jaw, and back here, the muscles are still holding on. So it's pretty easy to see that how what's going to happen next is that these kinds of techniques are going to expand, and this is what's going to start affecting the fossil record. Um, what we need to make it real, we need additional samples from some of these same organisms. Those are happening. Uh, we have a facility. We need facilities designed for this work rather than having it retrofitted. Right now, we've retrofitted. We're working on trying to put a, an entire facility together that can do this, dedicated to do it. And it's an interesting difference in our science because it combines all the sciences in one area. Um, the other thing is, and this I, I had to put it on here being, a, being a, an instructor, we need curriculum because even though uh, you know, I was exposed to a large amount of different training, there is really no such thing as an interdisciplinary, truly interdisciplinary training program where microbiologists and geologists get the opposite ends. And then varieties of new techniques are, have got to come along. Uh, and I've had a lot of help from coworkers, dates, things like that, uh, year or uh, 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 research funding, uh, the U.S. Lexan program, which was an incredibly successful program and therefore was canceled, um, <laughs> you know, uh, was great. And then we're we're still working on others. And I thank you very very much for your attention. I'm sorry if I ran over time. You want to do questions now or over beer? Yeah, no, we'll do it. We'll do a text of questions. But I, again, I would add one thing, though, beforehand. Um, you know, in the old classical microbiology, Peter Sneath was the person <laughs> who went down to the Natural History Museum and said, hey, do you have any old samples? And he said, sure, we've got all these old samples. Captain Cook went around the world and collected them. People like that. He said, I want them. So he took those soil samples, OK, and he he broke them open very carefully and isolated the bacteria. Mm -hmm. and, it, and basically, he could get cultures to grow for about 300 years. So he proved at that time uh, bacteria yep. would grow for 300 years. Now, the experiment, remember, is wonderful. You managed to get somebody else to go and collect your samples, somebody else to store them for 300 years, and then sit down, have lunch, 
data doing things out, who done actually track the paper? So, so I mean, just in itself, it's wonderful. But you see here now the way you know uh, Rasmussen really extended the concept absolutely dramatically now. So, uh, so questions, Peter. No, because no, because the rock seals when it dries. When the when the salt crystals grow, <coughs> oops, there you go. When the salt crystals grow, the the inclusions are all actually connected in three dimensions throughout and 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 so you have this growth and one side is hooked to the outside so the organism can swim in but then as soon as you get dryness the first thing that happens is the outside seals and then these sections here neck down to give you the individual pieces so the result is that you may have thousands and thousands of these tiny little inclusions that are isolated within the rock and isolated from the external environment. So the, dating is the, date of the, the dating is the date of the sealing. Right. Right. So do we have any idea how long the difference between the time of the culture and the time of the seal? Does it matter? It's, it, I, would say, I would say the answer to, the, to part of that question is no, we don't. Um, I, I'm going to say that in a grand scheme of things, it probably doesn't matter because it could have been five years maybe or two years or less. Yeah. Right, essentially, yeah. And on a scale of 100 million years, right. But um, we are looking at that actually. That's a, that's a whole other series of experiments it, it, that, that, that we are looking at. And we actually are using some of the organisms that I was referring to from Puerto Rico that we got out of a rock, we got it out of a crystal, and they, we can watch them swim into the inclusion and watch the inclusion close around them. Oh, wow. And we, we've got photographs of that. Some of this is reminiscent of the Thomas Gold Deep Hot Biosphere. Yeah, yeah, some of it, right. Uh, but, and and I, I just think it's something that, that, that's happened over the, you know, over the course of time, and, and, and they do it. Um, and it's quite fascinating. We're actually playing right now. We're trying to see what, 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 what is it that gets them in there? I mean, what attracts them to that particular spot in the crystal? And we can see it multiple times. Um, yeah, that's coming this summer, the next paper. 